Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. And uh, this is one of over 900 programs that we've done since the pandemic began. And we now have our audiences coming back uh, here. We have a nice live audience. And uh, Adam uh, has done two or three of our pandemic uh, live streams uh, with us over the last couple of years as well. Um, but he's here with his new book, American Midnight. So first of all, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. It's nice to see you here in person. And it's nice to have our live stream audience as well that we've built up uh, since the pandemic started. So tonight we have uh, Adam uh, again, as I said, his new book, American Midnight. Uh, this book and, and the contents are designed for two different groups. One, one group is really concerned that things couldn't get any worse than they are today in, in our politics. You know, all I have to do is read the book and you'll see things can get a lot worse. Now, that's not really optimistic. On the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, the other audience is that things come to an end when things are a lot worse if people stand up and say that's enough and, and, and there's some leadership that says that. And, and, and this is also part of his story. It's the best part of the story. So Adam, tell us about the time when it was even worse than it is now. Okay. <laughs> so. uh, perfect title, American Midnight, right? Yeah. <laughs> So thank you, George. Uh, I'd like to tell you about it with a slideshow. Uh, can you guys see the screen all right? Do you, do you turn the lights down? You don't turn the lights down. OK, but you can see the pictures. OK. OK, uh, I'd like to begin by asking you to think about some of the most shocking and dramatic events that have happened here in the last couple of years. You know, a president who tried to steal an election, the January 6th uh, invasion of the Capitol last year, uh, the killing of George Floyd on camera, uh, a string of appalling Supreme Court decisions. But imagine if, a hundred years from now, <clears throat> the standard history textbook said almost nothing about any of these things. And that, I think, is the case when standard American history textbooks today treat the America of a century ago. There were equally shocking things that happened then, still more shocking in many ways, and we've forgotten about them at our peril. Now, think back to your high school American history textbook. Uh, there was always a chapter on the First World War when the nations of the old world were tearing each other apart. The United States was not involved we, uh, the, for the first two and a half years of the war, we were a country at peace, a country of small town churchgoers, new industries, and hardworking farmers. Sorry, just let me adjust one thing here. Then, German submarines started sinking American ships. <clears throat> President Woodrow Wilson declared, enough is enough. We need to go to war to make the world safe for democracy. Congress declared war. The American doughboys went to Europe in those Forest Ranger style hats. <laughs> they fought bravely. They helped win the war. And then that chapter of the textbook ended, or at least that's where my high school American history textbook chapter ended. And the next chapter begins. You turn the page. And it's the Roaring Twenties, Flappers, the Charleston, Prohibition, Speakeasies, and of course, the heyday of Babe Ruth. But what I want to talk about is a missing chapter between those two. I said that the image of the United States before it went to war in 1917 was that it was a peaceful country. But it was not. It was a tinderbox of tensions with three big conflicts going on. One was between capital and labor. Routinely, dozens of people were killed in labor strife each year. In 1913, 1914, for example, more than 70 people were killed in battles over a miners' strike in Colorado. Uh, 
Another conflict was between nativists and immigrants. You can see some of that reflected in this sign and in this one. Uh, besides uh, the Irish and Jews, other targets of hostility were Italians and Poles. A third conflict that was going on was between white and black Americans. Most black Americans were doing miserable, low-paid work like picking cotton as sharecroppers, and most white people wanted to keep them in such jobs. So these were some of the tensions in this not very peaceful country of ours. And when the U.S. entered the First World War in April 1917, it was like pouring gasoline on three separate sets of flames. There was a frenzy of hyper-patriotism. These are Boy Scouts racing down Fifth Avenue in New York City uh, two weeks after the declaration of war. From the moment the U.S. entered the war came a fierce propaganda barrage from the government. This is a U.S. Army recruiting poster. There was tremendous paranoia about spies, which mixed with some of the ethnic hostilities. Look at this poster carefully, for instance. It's clearly a German helmet with that little spike on the top, but I think it's intended to be a Jewish nose. Now, I heard a lot about this atmosphere when I was growing up from my father, who had been 25 years old in 1917. He was the son of a Jewish immigrant from Germany, and the family spoke German at home, but they were terrified of doing so on the street. Uh, you could get beaten up for doing that. Schools and colleges stopped teaching German. Several states passed laws against speaking German in public or on the telephone. Signs appeared like this one at a park in Chicago. And throughout the country, there were literally dozens of bonfires of German books. This one was outside a high school in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Uh, Robert Prager was a miner in Collinsville, Illinois, who had the bad luck to be German-born. One day, he was seized by a drunken mob, wrapped in an American flag, forced to sing the Star-Spangled Banner, and lynched. Here are the people who lynched him. Uh, they were put on trial. The jury deliberated for 10 minutes and found them all innocent while a military band played in the rotunda of the courthouse. There was anti-German hysteria in other ways. No more Mendelssohn wedding march at weddings, for instance. Names changed. Berlin, Iowa became Lincoln. East Germantown, Indiana became Pershing. Families named Schmidt became Smith. The Frankfurter became the hot dog. And there was ferocity in the air at the very highest level. Take, for instance, Elihu Root, who was former Secretary of State, Secretary of War, Senator from New York, now in 1917 a special emissary for President Wilson. The absolute epitome of WASP, Wall Street to Washington respectability. He told an audience in New York in the summer of 1917 that, quote, pro-German traitors, unquote, were threatening the war effort. And I'm continuing to quote him here. There are men walking about the streets of this city tonight who ought to be taken out at sunrise tomorrow and shot for treason. There are some newspapers published in this city every day, the editors of which deserve execution for treason. People like him were as fierce as they were about the war because there was considerable resistance to it. A group called the Women's Peace Party agitated against the war. There were popular anti-war songs like this one, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. One strong voice against the war was The Masses, which was really the liveliest magazine in America at the time. It was left-leaning but not at all doctrinaire. It published John Reed, Walter Lippmann, Sherwood Anderson, Edna St. Vincent Millay, many of the best writers of the day. In many ways, it was a precursor of The New Yorker. And it and 
the millions of Americans who felt it was a mistake to go to war realized a little bit earlier than the rest of the world, which would come to feel this way uh, by 1920 or 21, that World War I was really remaking the world for the worse in every way and leaving a reservoir of bitterness and resentment in Germany, which of course 20 years later resulted in a second world war. Uh, prominent political figures spoke out against the war, like Eugene Debs, the perennial socialist candidate for president, who at one point had won 6% of the popular vote. And the charismatic anarchist leader, Emma Goldman, who started immediately, once Congress declared war, organizing against the draft. Six U.S. senators voted against going to war. The most outspoken was Robert La Follette of Wisconsin. And he asked, if this is a war to make the world safe for democracy, why aren't we agitating for freedom and self-determination for Ireland, for Egypt, for India, all of which, of course, were colonies of our ally, Great Britain? La Follette began receiving nooses in the mail, he was hanged in effigy at the University of Wisconsin, his alma mater. Other senators opened an investigation over whether he should be expelled from the Senate. Uh, Debs and Goldman would have an even tougher time. We'll come back to them. The government moved quickly to suppress anti-war demonstrations, and anyone who refused the draft was nonetheless conscripted into the military anyway, and sent to prison or locked up in harsh army detention camps like this one. And if, while in prison, they refused to do the manual labor that was required of all prisoners, they were shackled to their cell bars for the eight hours a day that they were meant to be working. Uh, this drawing was made by an artist from that magazine, The Masses, who himself endured this as a prisoner. The government crackdown on dissent had help from vigilantes. Organizations sprang up around the country. The largest was something called the American Protective League. Its members got to wear badges like this. Uh, that It says, you can read it, I think, Operative American Protective League. And if you look at the inner ring of type on that badge, which is sort of the size and shape of a police officer's shield, uh, it says, auxiliary to the U.S. Department of Justice, because this vigilante organization was organized with the encouragement of the Justice Department. By the end of 1917, it had more than 200,000 members, would eventually reach 250,000, made up mainly of men who were too old to fight, too old to go into the army, but who wanted to feel that they were fighting for their country here at home. What did they do? Among other things, they carried out what they called slacker raids to find young men who were unregistered for the draft. Sometimes also a slacker was somebody who refused to buy a war bond. But slacker raids were the comparatively mild side of vigilantism in these years. Other expressions of it were much worse. Here's one such episode. The people referred to in this headline were Wobblies, members of the country's most militant labor group, the Industrial Workers of the World, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They were seized, beaten, tarred and feathered, and what the article doesn't say is that one of the leaders of the masked vigilantes who carried out that action was the local police chief, and he had invited along the editor of the local newspaper to observe it all. Here's what it looks like when you're tarred and feathered. Uh, the man in this picture was a farmer in Minnesota who refused to buy a war bond. The people who attacked him were put on trial but found innocent. Someone else, an organizer for the Wobblies, had a worse fate. He was seized from his bed in Butte, Montana, in a boarding house, and hanged from a railroad bridge outside of town. Here's his body. His name was Frank Little. He was 38 years old. His crime was coming to Butte to organize workers 
in this mining town where some weeks earlier an underground mining disaster had taken the lives of more than 160 miners. Which brings us to the point that the real target of repression during these years that the U.S. was in the First World War was not only draft evaders and alleged pro-Germans, it was organized labor. This was an era of expanding unions, of many strikes, and business was desperate to suppress unions. Strikes were sometimes put down by military force or by the police. Notice that these police facing strikers in Lawrence, Massachusetts are armed with a machine gun. The war gave the federal government and big business the perfect excuse to crack down on the left and on organized labor because they could say, you strikers are impeding the war effort. Then something happened that inflamed tensions still more. The Russian Revolution. In November 1917, the Bolsheviks, the most militant faction of the Russian left, seized power. And the American establishment was terrified at the prospect of the Russian Revolution spreading to the United States. And combined with the intense patriotic fervor over World War I, this produced really the worst political repression in the U.S. since the immediate aftermath of slavery. And it happened on several fronts. One was press censorship on a huge scale. Uh, this 1917 issue of the masses, August 1917, was its last. It was printed but banned from the U.S. mail. Censors objected to several articles and cartoons. Here's one of the cartoons they didn't like, The Liberty Bell Crumbling. So the best magazine in the country was forced to cease publishing. Uh, this is America's chief press censor, Albert Burleson. He was the postmaster general, and the law gave to him the power to declare a newspaper or magazine unmailable. And of course, in those days, that was a crippling blow. Mainstream daily newspapers, no problem. They were sold on street corners or delivered to people's houses. But weeklies, monthlies, journals of opinion, the vast majority of the country's foreign language press went through the mail. There was no internet, no radio, no other way of reaching people. <clears throat> Burleson was a former congressman from Texas an arch segregationist, and he loved being chief censor. Between 1917 and early 1921, he banned more than 400 issues of spe specific issues of American newspapers and magazines, and this forced some 75 publications to shut down entirely. With his hatred of dissenting media, he would have been very much at home, I think, in the Trump administration. Ironically, the whole censorship operation in this era was managed from post office headquarters in Washington, the very same building that a century later became the Trump International Hotel. Another front on which the government moved was to jail critics of the war. Uh, I earlier showed you a picture of Eugene Debs. Here he is as a federal prisoner, sentenced for an anti-war speech. Because something else the government and business was eager to suppress was the Socialist Party. Like many war critics, Debs was still in jail two years after the war ended. In November 1920, while convict number 9653 in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, he was again a candidate for president and received more than 900,000 votes. He was far from the only person sent to jail uh, for speaking against the war. One of hundreds of others was Kate Richards O'Hare, uh, the Socialist Party's uh, most popular woman orator. She was from Kansas. And in prison, she found herself in the very next cell to Emma Goldman, the war opponent whom we talked about earlier. Uh, the two women became close friends, and they each wrote about their memories of the other. 
And for me, writing history is all about people. And when two of your people recorded their impressions of each other, it's a writer's dream. Goldman served nearly two years in prison, but after that, the government deployed another weapon against her. It deported her from the United States. Just before Christmas of 1919, she and 248 other troublemakers the government was eager to get rid of were expelled from the country on this ship. Now, remember, all of this was happening under Woodrow Wilson. And I think the point I would want to em emphasize is that you don't have to be a loudmouth showman to preside over repression. Wilson was the most genteel, scholarly, and dignified president imaginable. The author of a dozen books, a former university president, yet he oversaw one of the greatest assaults on American civil liberties we've ever seen. Uh, the year after the war ended, 1919, saw some of the worst racial violence in American history. In fact, in terms of the number of people killed, probably the worst. Uh, there were nearly 400,000 returning black war veterans and nearly 4 million returning white vet war veterans, and they were competing for jobs. And the jobs were scarce because the war industries had shut down. Nobody was making machine guns and tanks and warplanes anymore. Furthermore, black Americans were fleeing the South, trying to get out of a region where there was often an average of one lynching a week, and they headed north in the Great Migration, but very often met more violence there. These are white people in Chicago in the summer of 1919, stoning to death a black man. Wilson, incidentally, said almost nothing about this murderous racial violence. White soldiers on the street in Chicago questioning a black man. And lynchings took place in the North also. The mayor of Omaha, mentioned in this headline, had intervened to try to stop that particular lynching. Police managed to cut him down unconscious just in time, but the man he was trying to save was not so lucky. Martial law was declared in Omaha and in several other U.S. cities as well. Uh, in that year, 1919, more than 70 black Americans were lynched, the highest total in over a decade, and the total death toll of the 1919 race warfare was in the high hundreds. All but a handful of the dead were black. There's no accurate total death toll because the largest number of killings took place in a, play, took place in a, in a uh, town called Elaine, Arkansas, where both local vigilantes and federal troops uh, moved in to stop black sharecroppers who were trying to form a union. And hundreds of bodies of their black victims were simply tossed into the Mississippi River and vanished downstream. To this day, nobody knows exactly how many people were killed there. Something else that was going on in this period is something that, to me, f feels eerily familiar today. The U.S. was swept by a frenzy about deporting people. The leading candidates for both the Republican and Democratic presidential nominations in 1920 were campaigning on promises of mass deportations. On the Republican side, the chief contender was General Leonard Wood, a blood and thunder type who was, incidentally, the commander of those troops on the streets in Omaha. The front runner for the 1920 Democratic, uh, Democratic nomination was the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, who was determined not to be outdone as a law and order candidate. He staged the notorious Palmer raids in more than 30 cities in which he arrested thousands of radicals looking for people he hoped could be deported because they were not yet American citizens. Here are some Palmer Raid victims rounded up and awaiting deportation at Ellis Island, something a place that had previously been a place of hope, uh, the spot through which many of our ancestors uh, entered the United States. 
In the course of these raids, the raiders also seized and destroyed left-wing literature of all kinds. These are federal agents and local police in Boston. And they <coughs> trashed the offices of the left-wing groups they raided. This is the New York City office of the Wobblies, and the Palmer's raiders were proud of having done this and invited newspaper photographers to come in and take pictures of their handiwork. There was, however, uh, one unexpected hero of this dark time, uh, a man named Louis F. Post. And through an accident of sorts, he was acting Secretary of Labor. The Secretary of Labor uh, was on sick leave. The person who normally would have taken his place had just resigned to run for the Senate. Post, who was the number three person in the department, became acting Secretary of Labor. And this was important because even though it was Palmer's Justice Department that was carrying out these mass arrests, deportations had to be approved by the Immigration Bureau, which was under the Labor Department. Post, a longtime progressive, was outraged by the planned deportations. He was a very skillful bureaucrat, an experienced lawyer, and an ardent believer in civil liberties. He found legal problems with the arrest warrants, invalidated them by the thousands, and got most of the people awaiting deportation out of jail. All told, he was able to save several thousand people from being deported. This enraged the real architect of the Palmer Raids, who was a 24-year-old J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Justice Department's radical division somebody who would go on to a long career uh, after this. At this point, as I say, he was just 24 years old. He prepared a dossier against Post. He got the American Legion to demand that Post be fired. He got Congress to investigate Post, but Post held on and kept his job. Hoover lost that particular battle, but would go on to, min to win many others. He really got his start in those years, and greatly enlarged government infiltration and surveillance of radical groups of all kinds, something that would last for a century to come. He told the country he was monitoring dangerous progressives and radicals of all kinds. For example, men like these. This is the front page of a newspaper in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, about some people arrested in an alleged bomb plot by the IWW three suspects, and a supposed kingpin of the plot was the man at the upper right. Pittsburgh radicals knew him as Lewis Walsh. He was the secretary of the local Wobbly branch, active in the city's radical library. He was on the strike committee for a big steel strike, a member of other left-wing organizations as well, big supporter of the socialists, uh, and he was violent. During a streetcar driver's strike, Walsh and another guy jubilantly beat a strike breaker unconscious, the beating that's referred to in the lower headline here. Uh, somebody who was obviously very suspicious in the eyes of the authorities. But the whole time, he was really Agent 836 of the Bureau of Investigation, predecessor of the FBI, periodically slipping away from Pittsburgh to meet Hoover in Washington or New York and brief him. Some of what the Pittsburgh Wobblies were accused of doing was actually instigated by Post. Uh, a couple of years after this, his cover was blown in an expose by a labor newspaper, and he had a long above-ground career. Here he is as a lieutenant colonel and intelligence officer in the Michigan National Guard. Uh, another aspect of these years is not only did the Justice Department greatly increase its undercover actions against progressive activists of all sorts, so did the U.S. military. Uh, military intelligence in that era, and there were a thousand people roughly in the military intelligence division solely focused on monitoring radicals within the United States. They thought very much in ethnic terms. 
Italians might be anarchists, Jews might be socialists or communists, the Irish might be Irish Republican army fighters, and black Americans, of course, were an all-around threat. Here's a reflection of the army's way of thinking. This is a map they prepared, military intelligence prepared, of New York City in 1919, the upper right-hand corner of Manhattan. Uh, it's color-coded by where people of dangerous ethnicities live. <clears throat> Red is for Russian Jews, brown is for Italians, dark gray for black people, the bluish patches for Irish. The numbers on the map, the little circles, red circles with numbers in them, refer to union halls, IWW offices, and other meeting places. The blue stars with numbers are offices of suspicious publications, such as labor union newspapers, and even the journal of the NAACP, which was at that time edited by W.E.B. Du Bois. Military intelligence was so afraid that, uh, of, of upheaval that the army prepared a contingency plan for putting the United States under martial law, complete with wording of the proclamation that the president should issue when that happened. Happily, things did not reach that point, but it's a reminder of how close to the brink we came. Gradually, the repression eased. There were demonstrations urging the release of those still in jail. These folks are in front of the White House. Uh, in 1921, Warren Harding became president, and at last, rather slowly, in response to those demonstrations, he gradually let almost all remaining prisoner, political prisoners out of jail. He felt it safe to do so, to do, because Woodrow Wilson's repression had accomplished its purpose. The labor movement, the Socialist Party, progressive forces of all kinds were severely crippled. It's remarkable and appalling to realize just how many political prisoners there were. During this period of frenzy, 1917 to 21, roughly 1,000 Americans went to jail for a year or more, and a far larger number for shorter periods, solely for things they wrote or said. One of those, of course, was Eugene Debs. Harding finally released him after two and a half years in prison and even invited him to stop in for a visit in Washington on his way home. Here's Debs leaving after that visit. He joked that he'd run for president five times, but this was the first time he'd actually gotten to the White House. So what can we conclude about this era? I think it's a reminder that of the dark currents that have long <clears throat> run below the surface in this country and sometimes above the surface. Xenophobia, racism, an eagerness to hunt for scapegoats, vigilante justice. And those currents, of course, are still running there today. And it's a reminder of how vigilant we have to be about how easily democracy can be eroded. I'm going to finish <clears throat> by reading you something that Emma Goldman said when she was put on trial uh, for organizing against the draft in 1917. Gentlemen of the jury, she said, and remember, no women on juries in those days, we respect your patriotism, but may there not be different kinds of patriotism. Our patriotism is that of the man who loves a woman with open eyes. He is enchanted by her beauty, yet he sees her faults. So we too, who know America, love her beauty, her richness, her great possibilities. Above all do we love her great apostles who dream and work for liberty. But with the same passionate emotion, we hate her cant and her corruption. That was a good definition of patriotism then and I think it still is today. So I'm going to stop right there and uh... Well, let's, let's uh, fill in a couple of the, the great details here. So sure. uh, one of the things that you, I mean, you can't cover everything obviously in a half an hour. 
Um, but one of the things that people know about in history, but you filled in a little bit more detail, uh, was that the Germans, to help them in the war, arranged for um, Lenin to, to travel in a sealed car through, through uh, Germany and go to Russia so that he could help lead the, uh, the revolt mm -hmm. and, and then get the Russians out of the war so that, in a way, he was a German agent. Want to fill that in? Sure. Um, in, the, in the spring of 1917, <coughs> uh, Germany, which was fighting a two-front war, uh, wanted to try to eliminate its eastern front. Russia was in turmoil. They had just overthrown the Tsar, uh, but Russia was still uh, one of the allies fighting Germany. They knew that the Bolsheviks, uh, whose leaders were in exile in Switzerland, were committed to pulling Russia out of the war. So in the famous sealed train, they transported Lenin and some two dozen comrades from Switzerland through Germany to a Baltic port and then on to Russia. Uh, and Lenin indeed did take power some months later and did take Russia out of the war. Uh, the United States was deeply upset by this because it meant once American troops got to Europe, the full force of the German army would be deployed against them in Britain and France in northern France and Belgium. Uh, and that act by Germany sort of helped make a connection in American eyes between the Germans who were our enemy in World War I and the, the new Soviet regime in Russia, uh, despite these. So that, that, in a way, helped the hysteria over World War I uh, morph into hysteria over the Red Scare seamlessly. There's an idea that I, I, I like, which is, uh, that there's an idea that I like, which is um, that there is no idea or no, not, no approach to human civilization that's new, that, that ideas are always the same over time, um, but that uh, ideas uh, lose market share or gain market share in any, in any civilization over time. And uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, before the pandemic, I, I read an uh, an essay by a, a columnist in the Los Angeles Times, 28 year old woman. And uh, the headline I thought was an attempt to be ironic, you know, I, I, I hate my professors, you know, something mm. like that. And uh, she was talking about the professors that had taught her in journalism school. I don't know which one, I won't, so I won't mention it. Uh, I won't take a guess. But that they taught her that the way to, to proceed would be to figure out the facts, uh, to write up the facts to make them as persuasive as possible and, and proceed. And she then went on to say, this is so untrue. This is not how you get anywhere in life. What you do is you exaggerate and you uh, pull on people's emotional strings and persuade them uh, regardless of, of, of whether thing, something is true or factual or not. And uh, you had a quote from Arthur Bullard. That's the, uh, the uh, guy that was uh, at the post office that was doing the censorship, right? No, oh, he, oh. he was one of the people behind the U.S. propaganda agency during the war, something called the Committee on Public Information. Okay, right. And this is, this is your quote. I just love it. Truth and falsehood are arbitrary terms. There is nothing in experience to tell us that one is always preferable to the other. The force of an idea lies in its inspirational value. It matters very little whether it is true or false. Well, that's something, that's a principle on which I think many governments and many demagogues have operated for thousands of years, but it's uh, rare that you see somebody saying it uh, directly. But there was just a torrent of U.S. government propaganda during this period. I showed you some of it, both propaganda in favor of the war and, in, you know, and uh, emphasizing to people that the Revolution was about to happen in the United States, so anything left of center should be suppressed. You mentioned Theodore Roosevelt, who was a former president, uh, but quite the, the agitator uh, during the war, and always in favor of, of the war. And when I was reading it, I, your book, I was reminded of this quotation about Theodore Roosevelt. Mr. Roosevelt is the most formidable disaster that has befallen the country since the Civil War. But the vast mass of the nation loves him, is frantically fond of him, even idolizes him. This is the simple truth. 
It sounds like a libel upon the intelligence of the human race, but it isn't. There isn't any way to libel the intelligence of the human race. <laughs> <laughs> any, any votes for uh, who wrote that? Yeah. I know you know. That's a Mark Twain quote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Roosevelt does appear, Theodore Roosevelt does appear in this book. You can't leave him out if you're writing about the period when he's alive because he was just the most colorful and outrageous of American presidents, f filled with strident opinions. Uh, and he was no longer president during this era, but he very much wanted to be and was actually planning to run again in 1920, uh, although he died just before, died suddenly just before that could happen. And he was desperate also to get into the fight in the war. He was 59 years old, but lobbied furiously for Wilson to send him to lead a huge volunteer force, which he promised to raise to Europe. Uh, and he and Wilson absolutely loathed each other, which makes things much more fun. He thought <laughs> Wilson was sanctimonious. Wilson thought Roosevelt was outrageous and would make fun of his speech making and so on. So anyway, it's fun when you have two people who really hate each other, <laughs> as well as being very significant figures in this period. Uh, you cover a lot about Wilson's de decline also, um, that, and, and you have a, a quote from a French diplomat uh, who, who says that, that Wilson wasn't quite aware that he could ever be wrong. Um, right. You know, that he, I think that's an important part of the history of, you know, I think that paragraph we have in our history books about the League of Nations and that was Wilson's idea and then, and then the Senate for some reason just didn't vote for it. Um, but you, you make it clear that everybody thought, you know, this is an idea, but there, he had no political ability to make it happen. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah. It wasn't just an accident that it, it didn't. Yeah, well, Wilson is a very paradoxical uh, president. On the one hand, part of him was tremendously idealistic. He had this vision of the League of Nations where countries of the world would get down, sit, sit down together and resolve their differences. Uh, and I don't think in actual fact, if the League of Nations had come into being with the United States as a dominant force in it, as Wilson hoped, that it would have been any more successful in restraining human insanity than the UN has been since 1945. But nonetheless, nobody can deny that it's better for countries to, to talk than to fight. Uh, and his devotion to this idea really literally ha hastened Wilson's death because when he was in poor health, he set off on a month-long speaking tour around the country promoting the idea of the League. Uh, and speaking in those days meant shouting because if you were talking to a stadium or an auditorium full of people, there were no public address systems that hadn't yet developed this. Uh, and it was at the uh, four weeks into that exhausting tour that he had the first of two almost fatal strokes. Uh, the second happened a week later when he was back at the White House. Uh, that really knocked him out of commission for most of the rest of his presidency. So that Wilson is, I think, admirable, if somewhat impractical. But at the same time, he presided over vast repression. I think this country has seen nothing like it since the brutal era when the South rolled back Reconstruction or soon after the Civil War. Uh, you know, he, Trump's followers in 1916, in, in 2016, uh, shouted, lock her up, lock her up about Hillary Clinton. Wilson actually did lock people up. You know, as I mentioned, more than a thousand Americans went to prison for a year or more. Uh, he encouraged the vigilante justice. He presided over this vast censorship operation. Uh, so a very paradoxical Man. Uh, furthermore, and this, this aspect of him I think has become much better known in recent years, he was an arch segregationist who rolled back what little integration had taken place among federal employees. And the U.S. ended his, his presidency with uh, fewer black people working for the U.S. government than there had been at the beginning. Mm 
So a strange mixture of qualities. Uh, so that there's more hope, uh, let's talk about Lewis Post. So Lewis Post is a bureaucrat in a way, and uh, he's made his way up over time. As a younger man, he also made a couple of protests about some things that were made, or at least wrote, wrote some letters saying that's not a good idea. But I thought what I was captured by was the very clever way that he undid the bureaucrats, the senators that were there. And I, I think it's a, it's a method that would be very, still very successful. And it's, it's both having the facts, but having confidence and a sense of humor to, to banter back everything that's thrown at him. So why don't you tell a little bit about how he did this? It was because he planned it. And, and you also say what he planned that he didn't yeah. ever admit to, but he did as well. Well, I, I described what Post did, which was to use his legal skills to end his position as head of the Labor Department, which gave him authority over this, to get all of these people that Palmer wanted to deport out of jail. Uh, this created tremendous controversy, and in the very riled up United States of that time, Hoover had an easy time at first in convincing the American Legion to demand that Post be fired and Congress to investigate him and so on. But Post was very shrewd. He knew that uh, the Justice Department had violated a lot of its own guidelines and regulations in making these arrests. And uh, mysteriously, uh, you know, two months after the couple, maybe three or four months after the Palmer raids, something that began to change public opinion on the subject of the raids and on whether Post should be fired was a very eminent group of uh, 12 lawyers, retired judges, law school deans, law professors like Felix Frankfurter, who was then a professor at Harvard Law School, issued a, an elaborately documented report about how the Palmer Raids had violated the law in various ways. It was uh, scrupulously uh, annotated, documented, illustrated, uh, and nobody seemed to have noticed that the majority of the people on this committee that issued the report were friends of Lewis Post. He stayed in the background. He obviously sort of encouraged and orchestrated the whole thing. And then he, he or his wife, after he died, weeded through his papers that were left to the Library of Congress to eliminate all records of contact with these men. So that's what I mean by he was a shrewd maneuverer. And it's, it's uh, rare that you get somebody who is a really good bureaucratic warrior up against some nasty people like J. Edgar Hoover, and at the same time a, a person of great idealism and principle. Uh, the, 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 uh, those of you who read the book, the, uh, the whole story about how he interacted with the committee, uh, the Senate committee, the Congressional Committee, that mm -hmm. went after him. It was one of those things like you'd, you'd expect it in a movie nowadays or something like that, that, that it's the underdog winning totally just by charm and force of personality against uh, somebody attacking him. His story would make a great movie. If any of you here are producers, <laughs> uh, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> so uh, now that we've gotten our hope in, um, how about it's time for questions? Well, thank you very much, first of all. Um, there's no saying that, <clears throat> sorry, history never repeats itself, but it rhymes. And you compare 100 years ago to today, but there's one difference that I'd like you to talk about today, and that's the cult of personality hmm. that Trump has managed to, to construct around himself and the personal loyalty. I think this is something different from what we saw in the 100 years ago, and I'd like you to hear your thoughts on that. It absolutely is different. Uh, it's, I think we have to make analogies there, not to previous periods of American history, uh, as much as to Hitler, Mussolini, the rise of strong men for whom personal loyalty is the key thing uh, that we see in many countries right, right now. Um, why are we seeing more of that in today's world than we did 
in the United States of 100 or 150 years ago? I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. Uh, we certainly saw it, you know, as I mentioned, of Hitler and Mussolini. Hard to think of earlier figures who made such effective use of the media. I mean, could Hitler have existed with the power that he had before radio? I'm not sure. Um, so certainly media, and in our own time, it's not just radio and television, of course, but social media, Twitter, and so on, has uh, an enormous ability to enhance the influence of demagogues. But your, your question makes me realize I've, I've never even read something or thought systematically about why that particular type of demagoguery is so much more familiar today than it was a long time ago in the, pa in the past. I really, really enjoy your books. And one of your books, uh, To End All Wars, uh, you, you tied in the women's movement for, for the vote mm -hmm. with uh, the movement for peace and, and not going forward with World War I. And I'm wondering, uh, the American women got the vote right after World War I, and how does, uh, what's the timing of that? You know, were women also as active against World War I in the United States as in England? And what were the ramifications of that? Well, I think another uh, area of tension in the U.S. in this period was, you know, that between uh, men and women, or, you know, people who wanted rights for women and those who didn't. Uh, the amendment giving women the, the vote uh, on a federal level uh, went into effect in 1920, but by 1917 or 18, it was clear that it was going to happen. Uh, and millions of men were tremendously upset about this. Uh, you know, they had the picture of a much more traditional family structure, women's role, and so on. When the war came along, <clears throat> One thing that happened was that with some four million men drafted into the army, um, women were needed to do a lot of what had previously been male jobs. Streetcar drivers, firefighters, uh, various industrial jobs in factories. And employers, uh, there were actually some studies done that found that in some cases women did these jobs better. So there was a lot of upsetness on the part of, you know, more conservative American men that in addition to, you know, the Russian Revolution threatening to spread to the United States, we had revolution going on on the home front, too, on that score. So I think it increased the tension in, in those years. And it's no accident that uh, some of the anti-war figures who were most demonized by the government um, uh, Kate Richards O'Hare, Emma Goldman, Marie Equi, Rose Pastor Stokes were women. A question going back to Wilson and declaring the war. I've heard somewhere that he was actually planning in advance to declare the war. Do you have any details on that? I think he felt for several years, for at least a year or two before the U.S. declared war in April 1917, that this was something he wanted to do. In 1916, he was re-elected president with the slogan, uh, he kept us out of war. But Wilson was quite careful not to use those words himself in public. Uh, his feeling, we know from various pieces of evidence, was that the United States wouldn't have uh, the influence that he wanted in shaping the post-war war world unless it had actually taken part in the war. There was an additional motive as well, and there's good documentation on this, which is this, that by uh, a month or so before uh, 
Wilson asked Congress to declare war in April 1917, uh, he was getting messages from his ambassador in London saying the Allies are bankrupt and unless the U.S. joins this fight and can extend massive loans to Britain and France, the Americans who bought British and French and Russian war bonds are never going to get paid back. Of course, those who bought Russian war bonds, never imperial Russian war bonds, never were paid back. But uh, this was a real factor because Britain and France were in debt to the United States. If they lost the war, the U.S. was never going to get that money back. And by early 1917, the war was sort of a stalemate. It wasn't completely clear that the Allies uh, would prevail. So I think these were all motives that Wilson had for going to war and that he'd been thinking about for at least a year before he asked Congress to make the declaration of war. Yeah, uh, you, you've mentioned Post and, and Harding. Were there any events that kind of uh, got us past the midnight where the sun was coming up? <laughs> um, and, and just putting that in perspective with where we are today, you know, what I think we are What's going to get us out of this mess? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish I could say this country was in a terrible crisis 100 years ago, and we did X, Y, and Z and recovered from it, and we got to do the same thing today. I can't make that argument because it didn't quite happen that way. Uh, the country did go through a really rough time, which I hope I've convinced you of with these, these pictures. Uh, and the tragedy was that it actually did what the bad guys wanted to do. It set the labor movement back by two decades. Uh, it wasn't really until the mid-1930s that the labor movement came to life again. Uh, even the very moderate American Federation of Labor lost a million members in this period. Uh, it broke the, it shattered the IWW, uh, shattered the Socialist Party, and, and the American Socialist Party never would have won a majority of the votes here, but it was a significant force. There, were, there had been more than a thousand elected socialist officials around the country, and I think if the party had remained uh, influential, it might have, you know, pushed things to the left a little bit. So in a sense, you know, the repression worked, and that's why they could end it. Um, but there was an event, again, no analogy to today, but it's sort of an interesting event that marked a turning point. If there was one moment that sort of marked the beginning of the end of this era, it came in uh, 1920. Uh, Palmer, the attorney general, who was running hard for the Democratic nomination for president and was the leading candidate at this point, uh, didn't have good judgment. He believed all the stuff that his undercover agents were telling him. And he repeatedly and publicly said, on May 1st, 1920, May Day, the International Workers' Holiday, this sinister left-wing event, there is going to be a communist uprising. And we have intelligence about this from our operatives on the ground. And he mentioned this again and again. It was headline news all over the country. And people prepared for it. Uh, you know, they put the National Guard on alert. They hire, you know, extra security was put around uh, railway stations and ferry terminals. In New York, J.P. Morgan hired extra guards. Uh, the New York City police force called in all three shifts of the police. One shift was out on the streets. The other two were massed waiting in station houses. Everywhere in the country, something like this happened uh, in preparation. And on May 1st, 1920, nothing happened. And that kind of took the wind out of the sails of Palmer's presidential campaign, and by extension, out of the red care generally. Uh, also, the press, the daily press, I think, which had been dutifully repeating all of his warnings, realized that it had been had. Uh, uh, and by and large, the daily press in this period was terrible. 
they just repeated what uh, you know government officials told them. Uh, and uh, one of the things that gives me a little hope today is that despite Fox News and One America Network and so forth, I do think we have a more critical mass media than existed in this country a century ago. And I take some hope from that. Thank you so much for being here and for this book and all of your books. I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your process of how you find topics for books. Um, do you go to the archives with an idea or do you happen to be in the archives on something else and you have a nugget of a thought? Um, and how do you decide if there is sufficient uh, historical record uh, to make a book? Um, well, I wish I could say that a lightning bolt sort of strikes me and says, <laughs> you have to write about this. Uh, finding a subject is hard because, you know, uh, for me it takes anywhere from three to six years to write a book. And if you're going to work on something uh, six or eight hours a day for that long a period of time, you better be obsessed and fascinated with it. <laughs> and the problem is that most things that obsess and fascinate me do so because somebody's written a very good book on the subject. So finding my way around that is is the problem. And it's not always easy to do. And sometimes it takes a while to crystallize. Uh, on this particular book, I'd gotten to know this period um, somewhat because my previous book, Rebel Cinderella, was a biography of a woman who uh, lived through this time, actually was convicted under the Espionage Act, although she uh, won her appeal and didn't have to go to jail. So I got to know some of these people then. And I'd been poking around the period uh, for um, a, a couple of years and had done some shorter pieces about things to do with it. But then about three or four years ago, it kind of crystallized. Okay, I think if I focus on these four years, um, there's an obvious importance. I think it helped me that Trump was in the White House and I could sort of see <laughs> we may be heading for bad times again. Uh, then once I have the subject, and this is really true for all of my books, whether it's the Spanish Civil War or anything else, then I go looking for characters and it, who are the people through whom I can tell the, the story. And some of them obviously are people who have to be in the story because they were politically important people at that time, Woodrow Wilson, Mitchell Palmer, Theodore Roosevelt, and so on. But I'm also looking for other people. And in, in the case of this book, I wanted to dramatize what had happened to what it was like to be uh, one of the victims of repression during this period. So I found a number of them, a uh, few of whom are well known, like Debs and Emma Goldman. Uh, others are not so known. Uh, Kate Richards O'Hare, um, uh, uh, three pacifist Hutterite brothers from farming country in South Dakota, uh, two of whom died in prison. Uh, as war resistors. Uh, three middle-aged men in Covington, Kentucky, who were sent to federal prison because of private conversations among the three of them in a cobbler's shop, which one of them owned, which unknown to them, were eavesdropped on by a microphone planted by a local vigilante group. And, you know, I find people like these all right, you're in my cast of characters. You're in my cast of characters. You welcome to the cast also. I'm just, I'm always looking. Uh, you know, for people, first of all, where there's documentation, whether it's in an archive or somebody published memoirs or their letters or whatever, um, uh, first of all, where there's a documentation and where the person is an interesting character that helps me make a point about the period. Um, you asked about archives. Uh, I, I do spend time in archives. These can be enormously valuable. Uh, one of the fun things I had to work with in this book, one of the characters, in fact, I showed you a picture of him uh, 
supposedly named Lewis Walsh, but his real name was Leo Wendell, who was this longtime undercover informant for the Bureau of Investigation, which is the FBI. It added federal to its name in the 19, 1930s. Uh, all of his reports, uh, he filed several reports a week about the people he was watching, the speeches that he was giving, goings on in the Pittsburgh left and so on. All of those reports are in the National Archives, a place that's been back in the news again recently. Uh, and happily for those, I, I've actually worked in the National Archives in Washington quite a bit and on, on, uh, to some extent for one of the other characters of the book. Happily, uh, Wendell's reports, I didn't even have to go to the National Archives to see because a veterans organization uh, digitized as a public service all kinds of military records uh, from First World War era and other eras as well. And they decided that during the First World War, the Bureau of Investigation was fighting the war at home, and their records deserve to be digitized as well. <laughs> so we have 2.3 million pages of digitized records of the Bureau of Investigation in that period. So I could sit at my desk at home and look at all of Leo Wendell's reports. Uh, but not all 2.3 million pages. Of I didn't read through <laughs> all 2.3 million pages, no. There was, there was a couple of uh, nice little facts that I wanted to make sure uh, didn't escape before the end, and there's two patterns you brought up. One was uh, I, I saw industrial workers of the world, IWW, and you were talking all about World War I, uh. which, is world, which is just the opposite of it. It's like, like yeah. that's a weird fact that those things were got. The other thing that I, that I, small thing was, uh, you talked about the hysteria and, and the paranoia of the time, and that people who were in this paranoid field, they would blame uh, the Freemasons, the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, and the Pope. You know, and I thought, okay, well, the only difference is, that it, you know, 100 years later, it's, it's the Freemasons, the Illuminati, Bill Gates, and the Pope. Yeah. Just, just and George Soros. And also. George Soros, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the big patterns that you talked about uh, briefly was that so the bad behavior in the Philippines that the American uh, government engaged in around 1900 kind of led to some of this. And General Wood was in charge, the one who ran in 1920. Uh, as a Republican, but well, he didn't run because he was almost in, mm -hmm. and then he, he fell back just like Palmer did. Um, you want to say a little bit more about that pattern? Yeah, this was something, again, I, it was for me a pathway into this period. I had thought some years ago I would do a book about the Philippine War, which you may remember lasted like 1899 to 1902, and then sporadically continued for some years after that, a very brutal war where the United States suppressed Filipinos who were wanting not to be an American colony, which they had become in 1898. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos were killed. In the course of that, and this was 15 years ago, I think, that I first became acquainted with him, so to speak, uh, I got fascinated by the guy who had been military intelligence chief in the Philippines during this, this period, Ralph Van Diemen, who was an army officer who used the leading information management technology of the day, file cards, to keep track of subversives who were resisting the American colonization of the Philippines. And I have looked through those file cards in the National Archives in Washington. Well some 15 or 20 years later in World War I, he was domestic military intelligence chief here in the U.S. and built up an even larger collection of file cards about American dissidents at the time. And it was military intelligence, you remember, that did that map of New York City, so on. And their records happily also are digitized by this veterans groups. Um, and then I began to realize that quite a few people in this period were actually veterans of the Philippine War. Van Diemen, the intelligence chief, General Wood, you mentioned, uh, one of the key figures in this vigilante group, the American Protective League. Uh, it is almost as if suppressing rebels 
on the other side of the world 20 years earlier had been a training ground for people doing the same thing here at home. So I began looking for Philippine War connections for other characters and, and to some extent found them. Yeah, what that reminded me of is, is Guantanamo uh, and the use of torture there. And the, then the use of, of the techniques getting stronger against uh, like George Floyd and so on and so forth I'm in the police force here 15, 20 years later. It just seemed like there's also a connection between you allow it here, it influences it. But we don't have time to talk about the other thing, which is Hitler's, you know, that Hitler looked at our immigration law of 1924 and said, well, that's what the Americans are doing. That sounds like a great idea. Um, and, and so that's another whole element of the history. But our time is up. And uh, we want to thank you very much uh, for coming and sharing the ideas with us, Adam. And uh, so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 120th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, George. <laughs>